Between the recording and release of this podcast, the rugby world has been saddened to hear the news of the death of a true great, Wales rugby legend J.P.R. Williams, a former Wales captain who played for his country 55 times and represented the British and Irish Lions on eight occasions. He was a significant part in a succession of Grand Slams and Triple Crowns in a golden era of Welsh rugby in the 70s. Our deepest condolences are with his family and friends at this sad time. Sporting Wales podcast. Supported by Dragonbet. Your go-to for Welsh sports news and views. Hello and welcome to a new week, a new year and a new podcast for your sport in Wales need. We'll be here every Monday with me, Geraint Hardy, to review and preview the Sport in Wales week with the help of special guests and our sponsor, Dragon Bet. Sport in Wales is co-founded by Gareth Anscombe and Alex Cuthbert. You may have seen the magazine in various hotels, gyms and restaurants across Wales or have it delivered to your email. But now we're going from print to podcast. So watch this space as the stars of the magazine turn up here to talk all things sport in Wales. Plenty of opinions plenty of laughs and plenty of predictions so if you like your sport in Wales this is quite simply the place to be and we start our first week with two stellar guests the men I've just mentioned two superstars of Welsh rugby two friends and now business partners Gareth Anscombe and Alex Guthbert uh, warm welcome to you both um, happy new year um, Alex first of all how was your Christmas mate? Uh, very good, thank you. Absolutely hectic with, uh, obviously, the kids. i got a three-year-old and one-year-old, so you can imagine my three-year-old was absolutely ecstatic when there's about two, three presents downstairs. Um, but it, my back is still killing from putting them up the, the day before. So, yeah, it was good. Good fun. So Santa made you do some chores before um, before he kind of left? Oh, yeah. Gave me a big list. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, still recuperating from it. And, and Gareth, welcome to you as well, mate. Um, how was Christmas your end? Because you've got kids as well. Yeah, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, no, like Cathy, uh, really busy. Um, a bit of a change because we'd planned as a family for it to obviously be in, uh, in Tokyo, but instead it was back in Cardiff. But uh, no, really nice. Look, uh, lots of family around and lots of, lots of kids running around. And um, uh, Christmas has sort of changed a bit over the last few years with, with having little ones like, like Cathy. So uh, really good few days. Um, nice being around family again, for sure. We'll talk about Japan in a minute because uh, you mentioned it there. But also, um, you are business partners and friends. So did you buy each other a present? No, I think you bought me a coffee. And that, that was a that, coffee? That was, that was it? I actually bought a couple of nice red wines over, I think, uh, was it Boxing Day? Yeah, no, that's fair, you did. Yeah, I was, we had a cost me a few quid as well, so hopefully... So you thought it. about it and invested in your relationship and bought some nice wine and Gareth did nothing? He still paid me he back hosted. for when he, he, he lived at my house for six months, <laughs> you know, rent free, so he still paid me back for that. Fair enough, fair that's enough. Um, the business, um, how's it going, Gareth? You enjoying kind of that side of life? Yeah, most definitely. Um, really enjoying the fact that we get to to change things a little bit and, and doing these new ventures like like the podcast and, and the magazine's going really well. So um, it's nice to be involved in something outside of sport. You know, I know this has obviously got a big sporting background, but I mean outside of rugby. Um, nice to meet different people and, and learn a little bit about business along the way. So really enjoying it. And I guess the one perk of it is, that, you know, when, when you are injured and I've been injured a fair amount recently. Um, it allows you chances to experience these things. So really enjoying it, really enjoying, you know, the fact that we've got some good people on board with us and, um, you know, it's nice to be able to do it, you know, with a mate like Cathy and um, exploring the business world, which is which has been a, a big learning curve, but uh, lots of fun. Whose idea was it? Was it yours, Al, or Gareth? So how did it come about? Well, it was a, sort of a group uh, decision in terms of quite a few years ago, wasn't it, before COVID? Uh, we wanted to be a sports app in terms of, everything health and fitness and I guess over the years it's just evolved um obviously Root Media now have joined in as well um and it's just going strength to strength isn't it really in terms of never really thought we would go down this sort of platform uh, this line but we're both enjoying it I think and this I think it's got legs and then it's, it's going further and further and I guess you know the with the podcast now, we're getting some serious guests on here, I think, over the next couple of months, and it's exciting. And like you said, we're sort of, I guess I'm sort of near the end of my career, and same same as Gareth, and, um, you know, slowly, I guess, we're trying to integrate ourselves in, into the business world. So it's just a little little inkling of like what, what it's like. So, yes, yeah, really exciting. I know when Rio Ferdinand launched Five, um, which has gone really, really well, um, Alex Ferguson said that all the players are constantly ripping into him, saying, look at him, he thinks he's a businessman over there, he's a content creator. Um, have you had any kind of abuse from your, from, from your mates in the rugby world? We've had plenty. <laughs> I, um, when we launched the magazine, it was, it was in time with the World Cup. And um, obviously... The likes of our media department were chasing me to get photos with with the boys in camp reading the magazine. But 
I ended up getting Gats to have a photo of it. Yeah, and I saw that one. Yeah, I yeah. tried to do it when no one was in the team room because I knew I was going to get a ton of shit of it anyway. But he, he thankfully did it and was really good about it. But when you've got all the boys in the team with their phones out taking photos of you, trying to take photos of Gats, and it doesn't look the best from a player's point of view, but you know these are the things you have to do when, when you have a business. But um, yeah, look, I'm sure with this podcast, we'll get a little bit of grief here and there, but um, it's all part of the fun. Was there anybody in that setup that refused to do it? We were like, no, I'm not holding your magazine, I'm not doing it. Um, no, everyone was pretty no, good. No, everyone's pretty good. It, look, everyone wants a little piece of the pie at times, and uh, look, we have to buy them the odd bit of lunch and coffee to, to, to get them on our Some side. Some boys are expensive. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they want cash. The high profiles yeah. uh, want some money for yeah. it. You know? so, so the big dogs, so you, you'll know who they are. But yeah, yeah, you got no real mates in this game. No one's doing it for free, that's for sure. So a bottle of wine wasn't enough for them. <laughs> oh, it's a big expensive wine if it is. <laughs> yeah, so. fair enough. Um, yeah, obviously, we weren't expecting you to be here right now, let's be honest about it. Um, kind of, um, You put a statement out when your injury came and you, and you left Japan back for Cardiff. Um, can you talk about kind of from your side of view, what actually happened on that journey and where you're at right now? Yeah, I suppose there's a lot to unpack with it. Um, yeah, look, clearly wasn't in the plans to, to come back. Um, I suppose, look, when I signed to go to Suntory uh, and is common in lo- lots of rugby contracts, um, there are injury clauses uh, to protect, you know, the clubs mainly. But, um, look, you know, obviously picked up an injury um, at the World Cup and... Unfortunately, um, we didn't realise how serious it was. Um, you know, at the time when I did it in that in that warm up, uh, the plan was to hopefully rehab it and and um, try and get right for the semi final. I, I rehabbed it the whole week uh, of the Argentina game, and we were pretty hopeful. Obviously, we'd win, and the plan was I'd be fit for for the semi final. Um, I'd passed all all my tests during that week, so from our side, it looked pretty promising, and I was I was still really functional. Um, Obviously, you know, disaster struck with us and we lost to Argentina, which we, you know, we didn't see coming. But, you know, from a fitness point of view, we didn't think it was too serious. So I uh, got back to Wales, kept training. I could run pretty well. Um, and just before I left to Japan, um, you know, tried to kick um, as we thought, you know, I'd be able to. And I, I felt my ductor um, tweak again. And it wasn't until I got to Japan, which was a few days later, um, I, I scanned my duck there in Japan and I met Suntory up in, in a camp in Miyazaki, which is down the south, and um, had to wait a couple of days for, to get the results. And I remember speaking to the physio and he said, mate, you know, you've pulled your duct off the bone, which was really, um, I guess, surprising, um, but also really unusual. You don't tend to see a duct is fully torn off the bone. So... Once we knew that, um, going through the the pros and cons of rehab and surgery, um, you know, it looked like I had to get surgery because of being a goal kicker particularly. Um, flew back to the UK as quickly as possible. Um, you know, got under the knife really quickly in, in London. And um, yeah, due to, you know, I guess the, the contract nature, um, you know, the club decided that um, we had to part ways, which was which was really unfortunate. It is the you know the business side of the game, and I think for for the viewers listening, where Japan rugby is quite different, as you know, we're talking about massive multinational global companies. You know, Suntory is worth four and a half billion dollars, um, and they're a company. They're not a club. They're a, they're a company that mm. has a rugby team to um, provide a bit of. Um, enthusiasm for the workers. Essentially, a lot of these teams have have you know rugby clubs purely for their workers to go support on the weekend. Yeah, entertainment. For entertainment. Them. Yeah. Um, and they are proud of the teams. Don't get me wrong; it's very professional. You know, Suntory had a, a fantastic setup. Um, but because of that, you know, there's a ruthless nature to it. Um, but also, what people won't know is in Japan they have your class in three different categories of players. So your category A's is your you can qualify for Japan. You can play for Japan. Uh, category B is you could be from you know all over the world, but you haven't played for your country. So therefore, if you're in Japan long enough, you could qualify to play for Japan. And then there's your category C's, which myself, Liam Williams, you know Bowden Barrett, all those types of players that have played international rugby. Um, their class is category C, and each season um, teams are only allowed to play two category C players. You can only name two in your squad for the whole season. So once I was injured, they obviously take the risk of me not playing the full season and there's a bit of pros and cons to the club for, you know, do you take the risk? Will he rehab in time? How much will we see of him? So 
they decided that, you know, that, that wasn't quite worth the risk um, and decided to go get another international. Um, they had actually done it uh, previously. Sean McMahon, who's an Aussie uh, number eight, he's been at the club at Sundry for a few years. He's just recently done his ACL. So they just pull him out for the season. They signed Sam Kane during the World Cup and he's just there for that season. So therefore, um, their Category C players um, are in place. So you can – you look, each club has about – three Category C players, but you can only play two at a time. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, they decided to go in different ways, which, which you know, is upsetting, frustrating, uh, you know, a whole mixed emotions. But, you know, you understand the nature of, of the game and uh, they've got to protect themselves, just like, you know, I try and protect myself. Um, but, yeah, it, it's just the nature of the game. I guess that's what maybe some people don't understand with – Professional sport, it's pretty fickle, but um, yeah, uh, that, that's it's cutthroat, isn't it? I think fans forget that. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit different to over here, though, isn't it? Northern Hemisphere, in terms of in our contract, you know, a lot of, a bit more protected. Yeah, a bit yeah. more protected, I think. But you can see why Japan take that. You know, their season's a lot shorter, isn't it? Yeah, big and that's, money involved. Mm. That's the other um, thing. The season is very short there, or a lot shorter. Um, they do break in February for the first time uh, in a long time. They're having a three-week break, which I was hoping, uh, yeah. you know, maybe I'd be back around then. But, um, look, again, they just decided because their season runs from middle of December through till the start of May, you know, they need their top players playing. Um, you do notice in the Japan leagues the teams that, um, you know, when their foreigners are playing well, you know, it make a big difference over there. Um but, uh, you know, I, I suppose from my side, it is it was frustrating because my time at Suntory, you know, I was only there for two and a half weeks. You know, I really enjoyed um, the experience of Japan, um, experienced a little earthquake, 14 stories high, which was <laughs> which was interesting swaying uh, from side to side. But, you know, I've only got really good things to say about Suntory. It, it, it's unfortunate what happened, but, um, you know, a great setup, a really professional setup. Um the boys were awesome, uh, really welcoming. Um, you know, the language barrier is an uh, interesting one. It's a, it's a little bit tricky, but, you know, um, they're really welcoming. And and in terms of the culture, you know, again, I was only there for, for a very short window, but was really enjoying it um, and the way they do things. Um, so, yeah, you know, look, well, one day I might get back. We'll wait and see. Um, yeah, but, I was going to yeah. say, is that is is the door still open? There's still a relationship there for potentially something in the future? Or, um, are, you, or are you closing that for now for your own kind of mental health? Yeah, a, a bit of everything, actually. It's a fair point. Um, would I love to play in Japan? Japan, for sure. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess right now all the clubs there will be focusing on their season. You know, the season's only three or four weeks in. Um, so... We'll just wait and see. We'll wait and see. But um, look, I'm just you know trying to get back to full fitness. Uh, I'm desperate to play rugby. Um, where that is, I'm not too sure yet. But um, look, I'm hopeful I'll be fit in the next couple of months. Um, could be quicker, could be a little bit slower, but we'll see. Um, and then you know we'll just see what's out there. Yeah, after after that amazing performance against Australia, um, how devastated and how low were you when you got the news that that injury was kind of a long term injury? Because mental health and kind of coming back again, because you've been very few, few few knocks, but you keep coming back. Fair play to you. Do you know what I mean? So how how were you feeling when you found that the news that it was much worse than what you thought? That the tweak that you felt was kind of completely off the bone. Yeah, it just floored me really because I was still so functional. Um, even, you know, once I got to Japan, um, you know, I knew something wasn't quite right, but usually with people with these injuries, you know, they're on crutches walking. I could walk. Um, I even thought I could probably run in a straight line. So it just didn't make sense to me that I had such a big injury and yet I felt so good. So I think that's why, you know, we, we obviously, t it took so long to understand what I had. And, um, you know, obviously if I knew the injury was that bad post-World Cup, we probably would have you know, either rehab straight away or I would have had to get it cleaned up and I would have been back even quicker. Um, so it surprised everyone. Um, and I suppose, yeah, the shock of that and then and then the the reality of the situation is, right, what happens to me and my family? Um, my kids were supposed to move over with my wife in December. We're going to have Christmas in Japan. Um, we just moved all our stuff into our apartment and... Um, and, you know, next thing I know, I'm, I'm trying to book a flight to get back to the UK. I'm trying to book my surgery as soon as possible because I didn't want to waste time. And then I was literally packing up my apartment. And at the time, I didn't know what the club was going to do. 
um, they were still making a decision on whether it was a case of get your surgery, come back, rehab, we'll get you back as soon as possible or um, sayonara sort of thing. So, um, How long was that period? Because you, how, how many days did that take? How, um, how long were you waiting for that decision, I suppose? Probably a week. Probably Long a week. week though, right? Yeah, yeah. And and um I was kinda I was in Japan for that week, you know, so um it was tough because I'm now suddenly in a new team environment where you're trying to get amongst the boys, you wanna you wanna help out, you wanna rip in and enjoy training, and then suddenly you're like, Am I in, am I out? you know, and you kind of start feeling a little bit awkward around the place and the boys didn't know what was going on, but obviously senior management did and you're just trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then when we packed up our staff, you know, we literally guessed. We, I, I ended up, you know, me and my wife ended up making a call, said, right, we'll just pack up the whole apartment um, <clears throat> as if we're not coming back um, rather than leaving stuff and needing boys to help send it over yeah. and things like that. So we just made a decision to pack it up. And um, I suppose once we got back, then we understood that, you know, um, what was best for everyone was maybe to, to, to part ways for the season. So... Yeah, thanks for sharing that and being honest because, you know, I think that gives an insight to fans about the reality of situations because I don't think fans get get it. I really, I still don't think they understand. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about injuries. Uh, Kasper, where are you right now, Kathy? Are you, are you kind of fighting fit, getting back to fitness? Yeah, not far off. Trained yeah, today, trained a bit last week. Um, not available this weekend, but maybe the weekend after. Um, so yeah, close, been... It will be uh, nearly a year, so yeah, it's been a, been long enough. I'm just looking forward to get back out there and playing a bit of rugby. The first thing you said when you walked in was, oh, I'm tired because you've been training oh, this was, morning. Yeah, I've been tired, yeah. <laughs> I've complained already, I know. But no, it's been, no, it's good, nearly there. Um, just want to get back out there and, you know, it's been a long time. So Yeah, score some more tries, that's what we want, isn't it? Yeah, hopefully. Um, lots of gossip in the rugby world today, really. Thomas Williams has been announced that he's going to Gloucester. Um, you both know him very well, I, I assume. Um, did you know that was happening? Or when do you kind of, when does someone like Thomas share that news with his WhatsApp group or his friends? Oh, we, it was on the grapevine a while ago, wasn't it? I think, um, I, th- I think I, he spoke during the World Cup. I think he would, was probably wanting to move on, wasn't he? Um, but obviously leaving Wales, you've got to find the right deal and the right environment for him. And I guess Gloucester, that's a, it seemed, I think that'd be quite a good fit for him. You know, they're really looking for a, a nine to take charge and he's a world-class line, isn't he? You know, he showed the last couple of weeks and at Cardiff, how much they're going to miss him and, you know, living, I'm sure he's going to probably live in Cheltenham. Uh, they usually all do, you know, they're, yeah. they're playing Gloucester. I've been around that area. Handy know. for the races. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a nice spot to stay if we go there for the week. But, um, no, great, great signing for them. You know, he's a hell of a player and he's a top bloke and he's probably the ones that gives it, he gives us a bit of uh, stick most of the time for, do, for doing this. So, oh, really? Okay, yeah, that's good That's good to know. The 25 cap rule won't affect him, which is, which is great for Wales and for him personally, of course. Um, Gloucester, great place to play your rugby as well. They get good crowds, don't they? Um, I don't think anyone in Wales would have any kind of issues with him making that move. Even Cardiff fans can see the logic in it, Guy. Yeah, I think so. Um I would have been surprised if Cardiff didn't make a big play to keep him. You know, I'm pretty sure they they did. Um, yeah, they said they would. Uh, Shirat said he's devastated to see him go. Yeah, I mean, and so. and I, I suppose from a Welsh rugby perspective, a regional perspective, you know, there's a fine line because um, they need to keep hold of some of these players, and and you know, ideally, Thomas is one of those players. But yeah, look, Thomas is. I think he's had 50 caps now. I think he, yeah, actually, his 50th cap in in uh, at the World Cup. Um, so look, he's, he's, you know, he's pretty experienced now and a chance to experience, you know, the English Prem, which is, you know, a great competition. So, um, look, Cardiff will be devastated, but it's, it's a good move for Tommy, I think, a chance to experience something else, um, a competition that's, you know, firing on all cylinders really and, um, a chance to, you know, play at a different level and, um, Look, I think it's good for players to definitely experience rugby outside of, of, of Wales, you know, at some stage in their career, um. Guys will decide, you know, when it's the right time. But, um, you know, I think Tommy's been thinking about exploring his options for a while. Um, look, he won't be the last, will he? So, um, yeah, look, an exciting time for, for Tomas. Um, I'm sure he'll really enjoy it. You know, Gloucester are, are sort of looking to, I suppose, need to rebuild their squad a little bit maybe. And, and you know, look, like Cathy said, he he's definitely, uh, you know, a, a player that has, you know, world-class, you know, capabilities. So, you know, a, a good signing for them for sure. I think for honest, he's not going to be the only one leaving, is he? I think there's going to be a few that are wanting to be competitive in competitions. I think 
Welsh teams at the moment aren't going to be competitive for a number of years and he's one of Wales's best players and I think you know you're looking at the top tier players in Wales they probably are all going to move on to, to elsewhere to, to try and be competitive in competitions you know and, and obviously with the money situation which is very highlighted all around Europe isn't it you know French clubs you know they, they all know that Wales players aren't really getting paid what they probably should do so that it's tough for boys to get probably what they're worth you know? yeah and I think I think it's what fans have been doing since Six Nations last year when all the contract disputes happened was well what would you do do you know I mean, like, yes, we all want the best players in Wales. As a fan, I definitely want that. But if you were put in that situation, you can go somewhere else and earn more money and still do your job you love and play for a team. You know, you, most people would, if, you know, be honest and say, yeah, Joe, I'm going to move and, you know, have the money that I want for the mortgage that I've committed to, for example. Do you know what I mean? I think the only situation from last year, I, th- I don't think the public knew the actually 100% picture in terms of what was actually happening um, with contract offers and uh, and what they were trying to, Put the boys under um, and these new contract offers you know we haven't captain of Wales top player you know Jack Morgan who's probably on not even half of what he probably should be um, that, that's the scenario and that's what Welsh rugby can sort of uh, contribute to isn't it you know the regions aren't competitive and then the squads aren't competitive so then that's how you lose your top players because they can go to top teams so um, yes it's just a bit of a I think, I think it's a good point like you said though Garant around it does make me laugh sometimes when you see um, members of the public and, and you know, they're, they're allowed to have their opinion and it's it's almost great that they are quite um, passionate. It is really good actually that they're passionate about it but, you know, there's no way that you can tell me someone that does an everyday job that can get a even a 20 grand increase. They're are they, gone, they're are gone. They, are they yeah. staying? There's yeah. just, you know, and, and we're, you know, I can guarantee you that Thomas got more than that to move. Um, so it does it does make me laugh and I do get a little bit annoyed when I read things like that when you know you get people that having crack at some of the boys for moving and chasing money and you know um, people got to remember the game is only you know really you're lucky if you've got a 10-year career the reality of my situation you know you talk about making sacrifices yet we get uh, we get great opportunities and, and experiences and we do get paid pretty well but you know we put ourselves through a fair bit to do it as well. Uh, times away from our family, we we uh, get pretty. Um, what's the word? We can get um, not abused, but you know, people will have their opinions on us online, which yeah. can be frustrating to read for families and stuff. And you got to take that. And then also, there's the injury side of it. You know, the reality of my situation with my knee is, I imagine when I'm 55 or 60. I'm probably going to need a, a knee reconstruction or, or something like that. Now, I'm not complaining about that because... 55, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could, be, could be in a couple of years. But, you know, and I, I'm okay with that because yeah. I, I love the game and I know that, you know, you can get injured. That's what you're signing up for as well. Yeah, you know so, it, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to highlight that I'm complaining about that. But, you know, that's really my situation. The game is, is going to leave an impact on my body for when I'm older. So, you know, I think that players should go and get what they're worth and, you know, have players been getting that for the last couple of years in Wales or been treated fairly? No way. Um, like Cathy said, um, you could really go into depth about what players had to go through the last 12 to 18 months, the sacrifices a lot of boys at the regions made to keep regions afloat. You know, um, there were some big challenges. And, and look, COVID affected the whole world, but I don't think players at the moment at the regions – are rewarded or highlighted enough for the compromises or sacrifices they had to make to make sure the region survive in 20 years. But the guys that get paid in 10 or 15 years won't remember the guys right now that made those sacrifices, will they? You know, we'll move on pretty quickly. But had players really stuck their heels in or went down another route, well, Welsh rugby would be looking completely different right now. I think it's really important that you say that, though, because I think it should be pushed more. That And maybe in a few years' time players who have retired like yourselves will be maybe then more open to say, well, this was actually the financial arrangement. This is what I was offered. If I hadn't have done this sacrifice, where would that region be now? Do you know what I mean? So maybe in time that'll come out. Yeah, you're, you. you're probably right. You look at other, like I, I try and look at other successful competitions. I looked at, you know, NRL in Australia. They ended up paying, I think the year after COVID, they ended up paying millions back to the Australian League Players Association as, you know, they, they got through the, the tough part of COVID. The NRL is obviously thriving, which, you know, we, we know there are challenges with the, the rugby climate and particularly Welsh rugby. And so we know financially, you know, that's different. But, 
you know, the NRL as an example, as a thank you to the players keeping their product alive, yeah. said, well, look, here's some of that money that you guys had to forego. You had to give up some of your salary. And they, it was around Christmas time and it was, it was massive, you know. Um, you know, that thought goes a long way in players' minds. And I just think, you know, over the last two years, it just, you know, players in Wales have had to break their backs to make sure the game floats. And, you know, sacrifice has to happen for sure, but I don't always think it should be at the players' expense, which it has been consistently. So, Cathy talks about players moving on um, for a whole range of reasons, but, um, you know, I think these last two years definitely weigh heavy on, on players' minds and, um, you know, what they had to give up for sure. Yeah, interesting. Emmanuel Faye Wabozo. This is a great example. You know, he played, what, for one season? I think one one cap for Cardiff, I think. But he's Welsh. That's yeah. the worrying thing, I think, in terms of Welsh rugby, that he's a Welsh lad from Cardiff and he's wanting to choose England, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, this is um, when, the, when I saw, saw it yesterday or over the weekend kind of developing and I was like, you know, I'm a ridiculously passionate Welsh fan. That over the years, through my work in the media with, with footballers and rugby players, I've understood, oh, this is a job. That's, and understand your reality a bit more. Do you remember tapping into that? But if you talk to me 15 years ago, I would be hitting the roof right now at the idea that he has chosen to play for England over Wales. Um, potentially there's a financial thing in it because England players get more. I don't know if that's true, but on social media they're quoting, you know, you get 27 grand for playing for England per game. And, 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 and Wales are more between five and 10. I, I don't know the figure, right? But... What do you, do you, do you, do you bla- where do you stand on this, Alex? Because he, he he's fo- scored five tries in nine games in the Premiership. He's on yeah, he's fire. Going well. Yeah, he's going well. Yeah. Cuthy's glad. There's another jersey opened up for Cuthy now. He's stoked about it. <laughs> on, no, he's gone well, isn't he? You know, um, you know, he's at a great club. I know he, um, the boys, there's a few lads at the Ospreys who, who are, mate, who are mates, who, who he's mates with. And I know he does his uh, studies uh, extra uni, I think they obviously have a big impact in terms of he's obviously thinking and after rugby yeah. and obviously being a, uh, I think a doctor I think that's going to take a while isn't it part time especially yeah, yeah. a professional rugby player and I know Exeter are very good at um, looking after boys off the field in terms of that They're, that that's one of their main priorities so that's a big obviously impact and then uh, I've heard that Steve Borthwick has been on the phone to him non-stop so you know that's another reason in terms of um, him probably feeling a bit love from them I'm not sure what the contact was with Wales but you know, he's. I, I do think it is. Yeah, we we got to be keeping players yeah. like him, don't we? We, you know, you are right to be um, passionate and a little bit annoyed the fact that he's chosen England. I, I don't hold that against um, Faye, um, but yeah, you know, we we need to be keeping our best players. Um, I suppose from a union's perspective, um, you know, as long as they know they've done everything they can, or. Welsh rugby have done everything they can to support the player and, and try and entice him, you know, to the Welsh jersey, then at the end of the day, you've got to just trust that, you know, the player's going to make his own decision to, to best suit him. But, you know, only the union would be able to answer, you know, whether they've done everything they can to... to Let's hope he doesn't score a hat trick. It's wicked living against Wales now. In, in he's, in he's, he's, it's that thing, isn't it? When a player moves, they come back and they punish you. Do you know what I mean? All the time. But... um. It's that Sir Alex Ferguson approach, I suppose, when he used to kind of, you know, not tap up players, but, you know, be in contact with players, make them feel that, you know, I'm, I'm here, shoulder to chat to if you want, you know. Um, it'd be interesting to see from a WRU perspective how much communication they've had. And when he, Emmanuel himself, speaks, because he hasn't really spoken, has he, yet? No, I do think Rob Baxter at Exeter would have had a big influence okay. in terms of his thought process, you know, in terms of him being an EQP if he was England, how he fits into the squad and... It would have been a few little things like that, but yeah, it sounds well. It sounds like from again, you know, I'm just going off from what I've read, but it sounds like Exeter have done all the right things in terms of helping him with his his studies. You know, studying medicine is going to take a long time, and it does sound like you know, for example, Exeter Uni bend over backwards to help him, and you know, um, fair play to him. You know, studying medicine during a rugby career, you know, that that would take a long time and be extremely difficult. So, I suppose there's a lot of external. Um, sources sort of affecting this this decision but you know he has to be fair shown pretty brightly at, at Exeter and they've they've got that out of him so um yeah tough one that we've that we've lost them for sure but um again you know uh, you know one or two are going to slip through the cracks I think yeah we're not going to help it by talking about him but you'll get a welcome 
in Cardiff, Prince Batty Stadium, <laughs> when he arrives, possibly in an England shirt one day. Um, okay, just quickly, because we've spoken a lot about already about kind of your journey in Japan, Gareth, and, and kind of Thomas Williams and stuff. Um, just quickly, I want to talk about um, New Year's Day, Brewery Field. Um, great result for the Ospreys. That second half, you know, they, they controlled that game, dug deep, some good tries as well. What's your pick? Tom Shanklin, who will be on this podcast in a few weeks' time, by the way, um, was not happy on comms that that match was going ahead on such a pitch and such a stadium. Um, what's your thoughts on it, Al? I was doing comms on the game as well. I was next to him and I could hear him. So could you? <laughs> he, he hated the pitch, didn't he? Um, uh, well, I think it is what it is. You know, we weren't able to play at Swansea uh, Stadium because of the Swansea were playing. Yeah. And we probably had our biggest crowd there you know we had seven eight thousand people there kids were loving it ever it was rammed you know i know the pitch I don't, I don't really know what you expect from a championship stadium pitch you know it's not going to be these professional pitches that we play on and and the weather it rained all day you know and it wasn't that wouldn't have helped the first half was it just about held up and then the second half the boys it you, you could, could barely tell who was who it, it was, was proper old school it, it was it, i think yeah it was it was good and uh, boys all loved it obviously they won um which also helps doesn't it and this, there were six tries in the game you know and i know there wasn't too much rugby played but people thought it was going to be a lot worse than it was and um i think the whole occasion ended up being quite good i think i think the occasion looked good didn't it and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know i played at the Ospreys for two seasons and you know we, we just could not get a crowd down down to the Swansea.com stadium, is that what you yeah. call it now, is it? Um, so seeing the Ospreys get a crowd was, was good to see. But, you know, you can't, I don't think anyone can really say here that field was good, was it? You know, at this, it, it was fun in the sense of, right, this is quite old school. But once you get over that after 10 minutes, should players be playing on that right now? You know, I think, I think that's know the, the argument, answer that it? is it's no. It's top standard rugby. Yeah, of course. For, for, a, for a, what you want to be a global brand, it yeah. wasn't the best advert, was it? You know? Well, we, Rugby is still got to be a product, doesn't it? It yeah. still has to entertain. Um, it wasn't the most entertaining. It was, you know, entertaining from a slugfest maybe, but in terms of product and and actually seeing enough, you know, counter-attack and things that make the game so great, it, it certainly was a bit of a leveller, wasn't it? And like Cathy said, both teams had to, to play with it, so there's no excuse. You know, Cardiff can't use it as an excuse. But I think at today's day and age, we got to be having better services than that. I'm not taking anything at the brewery field. You know, I thought the stadium was perfect for the Ospreys, but, you know, if the Ospreys are going to go down there, they need to put some money into the field or, or something because you can't be watching that, surely. Yeah. We need to take the South African teams down there, don't we? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be so confused. <laughs> but it was interesting, you know, it was um, half the number of carries and passes in that game to an average game in the URC this season. So that says it all. Yeah, really it does. Oh, product, yeah, the, you know? There wasn't much leather left on that ball. <laughs> but I, but I, I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, yeah. watching it because it was, it was something nostalgia about it. In the yeah, well, and, and it was, and I agree with you. I think, it, I fully understand that, that, you know, conversation and argument, but... Um, the other side of it too, like you say, we, we got to be careful about how much we want to kick the ball and what sort of kicking it looks like, you know. And some of those kicks, it was just trying to just leather it down there, wasn't it? It was pretty. Yeah, yeah. It was, there wasn't much aim to it. It was just trying to get out of your own half because conditions were so tough. So, yeah, I think the, they need to definitely address that for sure. Well, BBC lost the um, lost the match. Yeah, the last well, exactly. ten minutes. The last fifteen or so. The rain got into the truck. That's what it was. was that, it so, was. It was awful. Yeah. All Did day. you see? Um, I know there's been a lot made of it. The the truck. Yeah. The Yes. I mean, if, uh, if I was going that, that was day, Welsh, I don't yeah, want we'll it to be in it. that truck just for the experience. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, good crack. Yeah. There was a guy singing in it before. Yeah. Right? There was oh, a, was it? It was a stage, right? Apparently. Okay. Oh, and then the fans just helped was, themselves. To yeah, I think it was, it was that wet. Truck, they just it? went. They were, the people in the front were getting so wet. I think they gone right. We're just going in the truck. Ah, so they okay. just went there. Well, well, hey, at least at least it was a good. You know, there was a great turnout, which was nice to see. Um, you know, we want fans back in the in the game, and and to be fair, you know, talking about fans, you know, I've, I have seen the last couple of Cardiff games down the Elms Park, and you know, they've been there. You know, been good, it? it's been really good to be yeah. fair. Um, the game against Harlequins, I didn't go to it, but it looked great. Um, I was there for the Dragons game, and although the game was done in twenty minutes, you know, it was a good atmosphere down there. Um, so it's nice to see some fans coming back to the game. You know, that's what it's all about for sure. We could do, talk rugby or pod. 
And we've talked a lot already, so we're going to go quick, yeah. quickly to football because it's been FA Cup weekend as well. Um, Cardiff got hammered 4 0, even though they missed two penalties. Um, within seven minutes as well, it was a crazy start to that game. Uh, Newport 1 1 versus Eastleigh, so they go to a re- replay. Swansea beating Morecambe 2 0. Uh, Luke Williams, their new manager in charge from Notts County. Uh, obviously, he was an assistant manager there before uh, Swansea with Russell Martin. And then obviously, Wrexham winning 1 0 yesterday, live on S4C against Shrewsbury Town. Um, FA Cup and a cup run. That's what I'm going to talk about to, to, with you guys. Um, is a cup run a distracting thing for a season when there's so much congestion for these kind of championship clubs and League One and League Two teams? Or is it something as a player you want to go on a cup run because it builds momentum? Alex, you can go first on this one. Um, no, I, I, love, I love cup runs. So just completely different, you know, especially in um, Europe, well, the rugby terms. We play a lot of different teams, don't we? So I think... The FA Cup, I've always watched the FA Cup from a kid and it used to be massive. I think probably the last five to ten years it's not been quite yeah. as sort of sought after. You know, everyone wanted to win the FA Cup. Um, you know, I was watching a game on telly the other day. It was like, they were called like Crabshaw team. I don't know, it was some weird team that uh, outside Heathrow Airport playing, you know. Okay. Like, I can't remember what game it was. Yeah. But, you know, and then, and then I think, I've you know, Tottenham playing teams in like Lee, like, Champion, you know, like the Conference North, you know, like t- these teams that are like three, four hundred teams, and they're they're absolutely trying to kick the hell out of these Premier yeah, League yeah. players, aren't they? It's a great sort of um, feeling of the FA Cup, and I think going on a cut run that, that only sort of entices uh, confidence. I think it'd be massive for Swansea winning. You know, they're they're, they're ten points from the bottom of the league, aren't you know, from relegation, and obviously new manager. Um, that's, I think he's just gone right. We're going to have a crack at this and get get this confidence going, and just hopefully leak into the. To, to the league and you know in, in terms of us rugby run we've had a few good cut runs with me at Cardiff um, I had a few extra you know into the final and you know there's no, no better feeling than knockout rugby that's you know that's the, the be on end already it, it must better. feel different to like a league game because you know there has to be a winner today and that means progression whereas if you at a league game you lose okay but we go again next week because it's, it's definite if you're out of the cup you're out right it's weird how even though you're playing from week to week, how changing a competition gives you a new lease of life. Okay. You know, e- either you're going really well and you're confident or oh, we've been struggling. Who cares about that now? It's a new, like different competition. We, you know, yeah. we've got Montpellier away or, you know, we can go and get a result and, and it's amazing how that can, how that can change um, and, and change your confidence and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I think when you talk about the football, you know, the FA Cup sides, I think, you know, it's it's pretty publicised how much guys like Klopp talk about the the season, and you know, God, the footballers play so much football. You know, yeah. so many matches, it must be extremely difficult. But I think it seems to only affect the real top sides in terms of they're more worried about their load. You know, in terms of you know they want to be in every competition possible, so they've got to rotate and and still trying to look after the league. Whereas I think the team's a little bit lower if they're struggling. The, the cup is an awesome incentive just to go after it. And like Cathy said, when you can watch the lower leagues. Bring a, a big name to the to the stadium and, and they have a real go. It, it's what the cup's all about, and that's that's personally what I love watching about uh, you know about those runs. I just get gutted when Welsh teams go out because it's that romance of the FA Cup that you know yeah. Newport beat Spurs a few years ago. Yeah, when Newport went on a run, they've had a few couple. Yeah, really, they've done they? good, that was Newport, actually yeah. you know, well, they had Man City a rather good. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. yeah, but you know Cardiff got battered four 0 against Sheffield Wednesday, a team they should be beating. You're thinking, aren't Sheffield you know, Wednesday bottom? Yeah, well they're down there. Yeah, maybe rock bottom. Yeah, you're right. But like you're just thinking, if they'd have won that game, they could have had Man City yeah. or Man United or Liverpool coming to Cardiff. But there we go. Um, quickly on Luke Williams, Swansea's new manager. He's been an assistant manager there before um, what's it like from a player's point of view when a new manager comes in what actually happens when do you get like an email before the press when do you find out you've got a new coach or does it change from coach to coach that you've had in your journey I don't know well, when I was at Cardiff we had about 8 new coaches <laughs> yeah. in 10 years so, so was it the same procedure every, every time you got, you got an email or was it like uh, no we, we got told well sometimes you sort of hear whispers obviously in the media I'll tell you what was nuts do you remember um, Hammers Mark Hammett uh, well, I remember there? coming in, but he wasn't in long. <laughs> so we we were. Uh, this was crazy. My first year, I moved over in 2014. I got here in, in end of October, and Hammett had signed from the Hurricanes in New Zealand in the summer. And in December, I've been here for about a month now. Uh, we're playing Treviso away. Um, I was water boy at the game. Um, I had a niggly shoulder injury, or something, so I pulled out the day of the game. Anyway, we're walking down to uh, pre-match. Uh, coaches chat before we jump on the bus yeah. and boys are refreshing their Instagram and it's Mark Hammett to leave Cardiff. No way. And we're like, 
what the hell is this? And we're all just showing each other. And he's literally walking down the stairs and he stands in front of us. He's like, yeah, boys, you've, you've probably just heard or seen. He's like, uh, this is going to be my last game. And, um, you know, I want you to forget about that and go and win. And the, boy, the boys got pumped by about 40. And honestly, <laughs> after that, it was a shake of a hand and see you later. That was the most um, clean off one I think I've experienced. That was really bizarre. So he'd been told probably five minutes before getting on the bus. I or, think, or, look, I think, I think he had, like, I think, I don't know what happened. I think Mark had a little bit, you know, made his decision himself, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, that one certainly wasn't handled the right way. So there's no kind of professional protocol how players get told of an announcement. There, there is at the there end of the season, now. isn't there? In the office, say if it's done, if the coach sees the season out yeah. and, you know, there's a new one, then that one gets handled a lot more delicately and professionally. But I think when it's in season and clubs are panicking and results aren't going well and fans are piling on, that one can be a bit looser. Um, Hasn't happened too much in rugby though, has it? I think Phil Davis, when I was at Cardiff, that happened sort of half through the season. I think uh, what most recent one was it? Mulvers? Mulvers, Hill, yeah. Uh, Cardiff yeah, have did, gone yeah. for a few. Yeah, though, they, well, they? they have. Yeah, they have to be fair. You can't deny it, can you? You know. Um, that, 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 so there's no WhatsApp group. It's, it's an oh, email. Yeah, well, the boys it's are official. Sp- the boys are sending rumours. Are they? Yeah. Instantly. Oh, yeah. There's a like the, the chat group will be going mental. Yeah. Does the captain lead on that? Because I. I would imagine the captain knows more than other players. Is that or is that not true? Sometimes. Well, I've been part of a team where a captain's probably got rid of the coach, <laughs> and I'm not naming names, but that's happened a few times. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, he's been you know he's been in talks with the chief exec or yeah, CEO yeah. at the time. Luke Williams also said this week, "I'm going to feel uncomfortable out of my comfort zone because he's going up a few levels, but some some of the players will feel uncomfortable about that as well because he's going to change style of play slightly." Um, is that something the players welcome if things are going badly and kind of? But it is like a, re, a solid reset, isn't it? A new manager coming in. Yeah, well, I think he did a great job in Notts County, yeah. didn't he? You know, they got um, promotion with Wrexham and they were going well this year. Really well. well. Yeah. So I think the players will probably realise. You know, he's, he's obviously decent. He's done a great job there, um, and they probably thought they couldn't do any worse than what they're doing, are they? You know, so because they were having a bit of a terrible run at the time. And, yeah, a chance of a refresh is massive, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's they would have probably sat down and gone, right, boys, we're going to change the way. Well, this is how I want us, want us to work, you know, in the in the working week and how we want to play. And then obviously they'd have their leaders and then they'd go to them, speak to them, and then that's how they disperse the squad. Um, and then that's how everyone ends up getting onto the same page. And then a win is a great start, um, you know, and then once everyone starts buying into it week after week, that's when you start seeing results. It's when... You get maybe a couple of bad results and people start reverting back to old. Uh, the way that obviously they, they thought, oh, no, this is no good. Let's go back there. They, if they stay on this path, I think, you know, that's how they end up achieving more things uh, down the line. Fascinating start. Thanks, guys, for the podcast. And uh, obviously, look forward to previewing the football now and the rugby uh, with our sponsor, Dragon Bet, which is the time for us to go over to Gran Canaria, believe it or not. James Level is on holiday and he's joining us via Zoom. James, how are you doing in the Sunday? With your, you've got, he's got his sunglasses on, everyone who's listening on the pod. You can't see him, but he's looking mighty suave. It's like Barry Island, isn't it? No, it's lovely. Really nice. This is all the all the all the Christmas winnings have been spent on the holiday. All inclusive is it's lovely. <laughs> how was your Christmas though? How, how was it, no? How was your Christmas for the bookies? Because lots oh. of sports going on. Yeah, it is a mental time. You kind of you got your peak times in being a bookie. You got Cheltenham, obviously that's the big the big one in March. But Boxing Day is just something else. It's crazy. You got all the football, the rugby, the rest. So I try and I always go to Kempton because I can't stand being in the office because my nerves are shocked by the end of the day every goal that goes in you kind of your heart sinks or you jump with joy it takes years off you so uh, I try and get to the race course and get out of the way even though I haven't seen you personally I've seen um, your advertisements everywhere I came out of um, Cardiff City Stadium on Boxing Day there's a Root Media van there and there you were plastered for like 20, 24,000 fans I think they had in the Boxing Day all walking past it well placed that one good job it was well, it was a good boost as well. I think we went. What did we go? I think we went. Who did they play? We played. We went seven to one Cardiff to win both Plymouth halves. Plymouth Argyle. They played. Yeah, that's right. And they didn't win both halves. So thankfully, because the traders were really worried about that, they worried their Christmas bonus was going to go up in smoke. But um, yeah, thankfully Cardiff didn't win both halves, so we didn't have to play out on the seven to one. So it was all good. For, for but, those yeah, fans, those, yeah. for, for those fans potentially, James, that haven't kind of been doing the the business with you on the bookies, um, tell us how Dragon Bet are different to other bookies across the UK. 
we just try and, well, we're proper bookies. I mean, we started off, COVID came. I was always a race course bookie and obviously couldn't go to the races. My brother's always been a professional gambler. Um, so we thought, right, well, we've got to kind of do something here. So we're trying to, we're trying to be real people. You know, you have, if you have a bet with bet, bet 365, you win a, you know, your accumulator shoots in. No one really cares. Whereas if you have a bet with us and it wins, trust me, it hurts. You know, I'm going home, I'm sulking, I'm <laughs> kicking the cat. I'm in a real bad mood. So we try and be real bookies, you know. And we try and take a decent bet as well. Some of the online companies, you can't have a decent bet with them. So we're, we're old school. We try and stick our chin out. Often we get chinned. But um, yeah, stick our neck out and try and take a proper bet and be real people about it. Good customer service and a proper bookie. Like the old days, you know, punter against bookie, not punter against computer. Yeah, I like it. They do some good boosts as well, Dragon Bet, to be fair. Um, do you change the boost if you think see Alex Cuthbert popping up with a bet <laughs> on your side? <laughs> He's pretty good, Alex. We do, uh, yeah, we, we keep an eye on him anyway. But no, this, there are certain people, you know, as a bookie, you're trying to get all the information you can. And we've got a couple of guys who are really warm professional gamblers who aren't allowed to bet anywhere else. But we kind of, we take them on and try and use the information as much as we can. So we know if, right, this guy's bet that horse from that stable, it's probably the day to kind of go with it rather than be against it. So, uh, yeah, there are certain people you certainly use the marquee card. And uh, Alex, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, I don't know if you should be saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, though, James, right? I was born and bred just in the outskirts of Cardiff, so kind of all the Cardiff clubs, Cardiff League is playing in them, and Ron Lucan and Taffy's playing against them. For you, for, for p- people betting with you guys, we, you can put bets on lower league matches, be it rugby or football, which which is kind of, it adds spice to that kind of local derbies that kind of people are going to on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah, well, that's the idea. I mean, we kind of, I personally, I think grassroots sport is so important, you know, it's, it's a real important thing and people need to, we, if we can add to it in any way, if someone, someone can go and watch their local team, they can watch whoever's playing against the against each other, Canton against Fairwater, they can put that in their accumulator against Man United and Man City and just add a bit of spice and just, it's fun, isn't it? It's what gambling should be, just, a, you know, a bit of fun, get beyond your local boys, have a few quid on. And you can beat them up if they get beat then. No word of a lie now, right? Um, my mates, lots of them, like around Ponticlean Rugby Club, right? And uh, the San Aaron are going really well in Division 2 at the moment. And they, uh, I told them about Dragon Bet and you could do this. And they were like, oh, I'm betting on San Aaron every single weekend. <laughs> so if you, get a, if you get an influx of San Aaron bets, James, you know where they're coming from. Uh, from well, from, if we win, I'll come and ask to borrow five fiver off you. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, every single week on the pod, James, we're going to be doing Dragon Bet Game of the Week. So um, tell us what you've got for us this week then. Yeah, again, so the game of the week, we're just trying to kind of shine a light on a local game. We don't take massive bets on it, so there's no kind of corruption concerns or anything like that. But we try and find a local game where there's a bit of kind of needle. I was hoping, actually, there's a real good game. It's not it's not on. There's Flint Mountain against Rill. So they're playing in the FAW Cup. It got postponed. I was hoping to be back on this weekend because last time they played, there was 11, red card, 11 yellow cards, four red cards. It was a proper tear-up. So they're the kind of <laughs> games we're looking for. Um, so people can have a better bet. But unfortunately, that's not on this weekend. So we're going to... With the um, with the rugby, we're going to go for Abatus Abatus Falcons against Lacan. So Lacan, obviously the birthplace of Dylan Thomas. Um, it's a proper east against west kind of um, kind of boasting rights. So it's the WIU Division Three third round of the cup, and we've got Abatus as slight favourites of one to two, and Lacan at six to four. So again, it'll be east versus west. See who's best. They're both doing okay in their leagues, but it'll be a good championship, good good fight out. And uh, if you have a bet on it, you know where to come. Oh, for me, see, for my art side of my brain, I've got to go Dylan Thomas and all that there. Do you know what I mean? Straight away. <laughs> Alex, which way are you going to go on that one? I wouldn't have a clue. I'm not going <laughs> to... <laughs> yeah, any mini money, my art. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of fun, just pick one and go for it, I suppose, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. It's, um, good. it's a good test for our odds compiler as well, you know, because he's really going to get his head stuck in and make sure he's uh, he's got it right. Because if you make a mistake on these games, people jump on you. You know, you wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you're taking 200 bets on Lacan. You're like, what's going on here? Is <laughs> he throwing in one of the clubs yeah. up? He goes, oh, how are you going on? And stuff like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question for Kathy, though. Like, how much research do you do into that? That's quite a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of time for, for a small market. Obviously, that we, you know, they're not huge revenue makers, but it takes up a lot of our time. But it's part of who we are. You know, we love, we love back in Welsh sport. We love Welsh sport in general and grassroots sport. So, um, it's something we put a lot of time into and, um, don't always get it right. But yeah, it's good fun. It's a new year, guys. So um, every start of season, I put a bet on something kind of for the end of the season. And then sometimes you review it halfway through the season. Have you got any um, fun bets, James, that people can kind of have a little bet on for, from now and between the end of the season? 
I don't know about fun bets, but a real good bet. I think Wrexham to win the league, eleven or four. They are just well. These boys know about momentum. When you got yeah, momentum, you and kind of the following they've got, and just everything is going right, isn't it? So um, Wrexham to win the league, eleven or four. What are they two points off Stockport? The game in hand. Yeah, it just seems like a good bet to me. And just see Paul. I, I, I'm away, so I didn't see the game the other day. But I saw a clip of Paul Mullen putting in a tackle in the ninetieth minute. I mean, when those guys are trying that hard uh, with everyone behind them. It's got to be a good bet, 11 or 4. I mean, that was an example of a striker. You know, a goal means a lot to a striker, but that, that tackle was like a goal. It was unbelievable. They, they put a shift in. Um, loads of people must be taking that one up, surely, or will be. Yeah, yeah, it's really popular. It's, that's the thing about being a Welsh book. It's bloody horrible because I want the Welsh teams to win, but it normally costs me money. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, don't mind. There's certain things you don't mind paying through your pocket for and seeing Rex and win the league. When, you know, I could manage that, I think. Okay, how about Cardiff? How, how, anything for Cardiff? Because they're trying to get into the playoffs, I suppose. Yeah, what are they, 12 to 1 to be in the top six? Not a bad bet, but I don't know. Will they do it? I'm not sure. Bigger than that, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it depends how they recruit, I suppose. Um, would your yeah. odds change if, kind of, I don't know, Kiefer Moore turns up and David Brooks or something like that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We Actually, we put up odds on Kiefer Moore to join Cardiff a few months ago. I think we had him like four to five and someone jumped on it. it straight away and I thought oh this looks a bit suspect but um, we haven't had any money for him lately so I don't know if it's gone a bit quiet there well there's, there's apparently nine clubs sniffing around Kiefer Moore right now and like Middlesbrough being one of them Leeds being another so like it depends how do you feel quickly Gareth and um, Alex about returning to a club because that's what Kiefer would do he'd be returning to Cardiff um, it can be kind of a romantic thing I suppose Is it? what's your opinion on it um yeah, look, it, there is a romantic side to it. I, I suppose it all depends on what you've experienced during the time you've been away, but um, I've always been one for maybe trying to keep, you know, experiencing other things. But I think there comes a time in a guy's career that, you know, when you've got family and mates and stuff, maybe, you know, you want to finish your career somewhere, then then for sure, you know, it, it can be that, like you say, the, the, the fantasy of that can be quite special sometimes. Well, it's different. I think how long because we've played a long time now. If I if I went back to Cardiff, there's probably only three players there left yeah. who I used to play with or, or good mates with. So, but um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd just like to experience um, new, you know new experiences elsewhere. I think really is the, the main thing. And you, and sometimes you know you never know sort of the relationships um, when you've left are on good terms or better. So yeah, uh, different coaches and so forth. So. All depends. We know, none of us know really what happened with Kiefer Moore, do we? So um, only right. time will tell. Only time will tell. Any other kind of uh, accumulators we should be looking out for? Kind of or, or kind of Swansea to go down. It's always difficult when you get a new manager, and that Swansea to go down at fourteen to one. I'm a Cardiff boy, so all the Swans fans <laughs> will hate me for this, but I don't think that's a terrible. You know, when you get new off. managers in, things can change a lot, can't they? So they're they're two hundred to one to go up. So that's probably not going to happen. But fourteen to one to go down. Who knows? I don't know. I, I I don't see that happening. For going down Swansea, no way, no way. I think I think James. I think honest. Luke Williams is going to be I a real stay, positive yeah. thing. Yeah, I think so. Particularly after the weekend. Yeah. So we'll see. Okay, but let's turn our attention with, with, with to preview. Sorry, Gareth, for, that's ruining my holiday. Talking about Luke Williams, we got stung on that. So we put up the manager market next Swansea manager, and these things are really hard to do as a bookie because you're kind of guessing, and then it's just kind of wait of money finds the market, and we had we had him at twenty to one, and all of a sudden there was just. Woke up one morning, there was a load of bets queued up for Luke Williams at twenty to one. So I think I think a few people knew about that before we did anyway. <laughs> yeah, so that's whole family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so annoying. That you know, it's a good Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> well, twenty to one is good because good winnings as well. Um, James, let's turn our attention then to European rugby this weekend. Uh, we had no URC the weekend that's just been. Um, Ospreys, Perpignan, Clermont versus Scarlet, Zebra Dragons, and then we've got we've got Car- Cardiff versus Quinns, of course. Um, Give us the rundown of odds for these four games, if you can. Then we'll get um, Gareth and Alex's opinion on it. Well, we haven't got the odds up for all the games at the moment. So, um, you know, rugby's so team-dependent, isn't it? So we kind of wait later in the week for most of these matches. So I think most of the games will be out on uh, on Wednesday. But we've got the Cardiff-Harlequins match. So Cardiff are 11-4 against Harlequins with 2-5. to five, And you can bet the Harlequins with eight points start, which I thought was not a bad bet. You know, packed arms park, a few people behind them, a bit of momentum. Um, yeah, I thought... Getting eight points at home isn't a bad bet, really, for Cardiff. That's a good one, Al. I think so, yeah. I think they've, if you look at their run this year, they've lost, I think every game they've lost, they've lost less than seven, close, isn't it? Yeah. seven to eight points every game. So um, that'd be close. And at home, they're, they're awfully tough to beat at home. I think Quinn, Harlequins will have to play really well to uh, to beat them especially they the weren't far, did they play them last year? I think it went really close last year as well, wasn't it? They've so, had a few, uh, just generally in 
history, I think there's, they've always been competitive, these two games, for some reason. You yeah. know, it's never been a big Partic- tilt between like them. Like Cathy said, particularly at home, I think Cardiff always back themselves. You know, the pitch, um, uh, you know, it'll be full down Dams Park on Sunday night. It'll be a good occasion. So, yeah, I think that's definitely... Um, uh, Joe Marler's Mar- injured, so their scrum won't be okay. quite as dominant. Um, and they, they're two teams that play an awful lot of rugby, so it'd be a big scoring game, I think. Yeah. I'm going Cardiff that's to win that one. What's, what's the toughest game to put, what's, what's the toughest venue to play at in Wales? In Wales, uh, yeah. Brewery Field. <laughs> <laughs> you might have missed that, James, and you might be in Gran Canaria, but it was, a, it was kind of just mud, a mud bath on New Year's Day um, oh, as Ospreys okay. took um, on Cardiff. Oh, I saw it with the van. I'd yeah, say, yeah. but from, um, from obviously, obviously we was at Cardiff, but as an Ospreys fan, uh, player, pl- playing the Arms Park is pretty tough, isn't it? I think just how quick it is um, and knowing how well they are at home. You know, they're, they're very good at home, Cardiff, especially when they get a full pack crowd and... They, they very rarely lose by much, you know, at home, do they? If not, very often. I fancy Cardiff, big style for that. Big crowd. Well, I think they played Bath a couple of weeks ago and they really went close to winning that. The only thing that let them down was, you know, the difference and probably the the replacements, particularly up front. You know, they probably just got bullied the last 10 minutes up front. Whereas I don't know if Harlequins are quite as big. So, you know, I think Cardiff will definitely fancy themselves. For sure. But Cardiff got some great talent second row and, and in the pack, do you know what I mean? So maybe it's just kind of the young, the start it's just the 15. Depth. Yeah, 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 it's just yeah, the yeah. depth, you know. But yeah. yeah, it'll be a good occasion down there for sure. Okay, Osprey's Perpignan. Um, Alex, um, will you be involved? You're not quite thinking you're going to be involved, no? No, I don't think so, not this week. Um, but we're going strong squad against a team that were sort of languishing sort of near the bottom of the uh, top 14 they won't send a strong side will they? No, they've won the last three, four games in the league and they've worked their way up. Yeah. Um, I think their league is probably their main concern. Um, but they, relegation. Yeah, they're, they're, they still play a bit of rugby. Um, and I think hopefully, you know, we, we obviously have an awful lot of injuries. You know, we've got some, a lot of players out. Yeah. Um, it'll still be tough. But I think we know if we get if we can get a win, we, we're hopefully into the next round. So, um, big incentive for us. Yeah, it's a big game, isn't it? And yep. James, odds will come on that, on on, on Dragon Bet, of course. Um, Guy, how do you see that one going? Yeah, no, I think, um, I think depending on conditions, yeah, you'd think Osprey's... By by ten, I'd say. Now Scarlet, oh Scarlet, I I can't get over the fact they lost to to, to the Lions. You know, it was just mm. kind of losing that game. Who have of, they got? Are they playing Clermont in Clermont? Yeah, Clermont uh, find their feet in their league, aren't they? A little bit. I they did have a good result on the weekend. They drew. Uh, they drew with. Oh my god! Was it Stade Francais who who are coming third? I think so. They're a decent result on the weekend. Um, they have been struggling. But, yeah, I'd say they're going to be too strong. Um, too much, yeah. It's particularly, you know, they're one of the best sides in Europe at home. You know, really get beaten. I know they're not as well as they have been the last, you know, couple of seasons, but I can't imagine... Um, It'd be tough, because uh, yeah, especially Scarlet's sense. confidence going there. First 10, 20 minutes, it's quite a scary sort of stadium in terms of... It's intimidating. At- intimidating well. atmosphere. That, that, yeah, that's a tough game. I think I'm not sure what team they're going to be sending out. You know. Yeah. So if Clermont get on top early, it's yeah. going to be hard work. Yeah. yeah. It'll be very tough. Okay. Yeah. And the, dra- the Dragons going all right actually in the Challenge Cup so far. Um, Zebra away is in is in front of them. Uh, Alex, you're shaking your head there a little bit straight away. Yeah, they're playing some good rugby. You know, yeah, they're, yeah. they're attacking wise. They're scoring a lot of points. Um, I do think that'd be quite a tough uh, game for the Dragons. Uh, they're going all right. I think Zebra. I think they know, they only need a win as well to get maybe qualify as well. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, that'd be tough. I think the Dragons, they just, I don't know, they, get, they put themselves in situations to win games, don't they? But they just can't, they can't, can they? I just find they, they just do too many basic mistakes and you're like, ah, oh, if you had not done them, you'd have been in with a chance till the death of a game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think also it's one of those games, I think Zebra, you know, they, they've obviously struggled for a long time and they haven't gone too well this season, but they've definitely made changes in the way they play. I think, you know, they haven't had too many wins, so this one, you know, they're going to be right up for a chance to get a win at home, and that'll be important for them. Like Cathy said, if they can win and get qualified, then yeah, I think Zebra might just be a bit too much at home. You've got to score twenty plus points to beat them. Yeah, they will score. Yeah. They, 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 they are, do they score are actually. Tries. Yeah, they are. They so. are. They are tricky at home, Zebra. When they get the touch judges involved and the, <laughs> and the <laughs> crowds are going, they yeah. they are tricky out there. You know, we've I was out there one year with Cardiff. We're up twenty one nil, and I think uh, we end up drawing twenty eight all or something. So yeah, yep, they uh, they they can be tough out there for sure. That one hurt. I can tell you better about that. Still. <laughs> yeah, we should miss the kick to win that. <laughs> so James, I suppose the inside knowledge here is they're going to go for Cardiff to win, Ospreys to win, Scarlets and Dragons to lose. So that might help you as you come to your odds. 
card marked properly. But the boys made a point there. When you go for rugby, uh, this is a tip as a punter. Rugby, the team news is so, so important. The, the odds can change vastly between the start of the week and the end of the week. So if you can get a little bit of a uh, get on the ball with when you find out the team news, you've got a chance of beating us horrible bookies now and again. Do you find, James, the weather it plays more of a part in rugby than football as well? In terms of conditions? Yeah, huge, especially, especially because the main rugby bet is hand, handicap, right? So, um, yeah the handicaps can move vastly so we're always trying to keep an eye on the weather we're always trying to keep an eye on the team news it's, it's really hard football's not too, football's quite a settled market but when it comes to rugby things can change really really quickly yeah. so um, yeah, it's, it's not easy being a bookie on rugby OK talking That's about sure. football though uh, next James Cardiff versus Leeds massive match big rivalry Cardiff have beat them quite a few times in the FA Cup for famous wins um, Leeds chasing the top two they've fallen behind but Cardiff chasing playoffs both teams really need a win of this. You know, Cardiff are home. Um, how do you see this one going? I don't know. I think, like you say, Cardiff leads. You've got back Cardiff, haven't you? They're nine or two at the moment, which seems really big odds to me. You know, I think you'd take a chance at four and a half to one, wouldn't you, for um, Cardiff to do what they've done so many times before and, and beat Leeds at home. Um, yeah, so nine or two Cardiff seems a bit of value. Yeah, do you know what? And Leeds bring loads of fans always to that game, and that definitely helps Cardiff City players. You know, if you look at teams historically have come there with a big crowd and they fill the kind of the away end with four or five thousand plus, they're making noise. It just builds up to that level. I suppose is it easier as players to play with with an atmosphere? Yeah, no, no question, absolutely no question. I think that's why you know when you're playing big games and then you come back to your club sometimes it's tricky mainly because of the excitement what the you know a crowd and what an atmosphere can build so I think no question um, anything with a bit of excitement and intensity that crowd brings I think you know all players um, football whatever sport it is I think love playing in front of crowds for sure Okay let's go to Birmingham Swansea uh, Birmingham 28 points Swansea 32 if Swansea win this game they really kind of get away from that bottom cluster of teams Luke Williams new manager won obviously against Morecambe on the weekend but it could go like Wayne Rooney's reign in Birmingham which was <laughs> disastrous <laughs> um, oh. what, what odds are you going to give for a, for a Swansea away win on this one James? We're 2-1 to one Swansea so again it's it's Dragon Bet. We always try and be the top odds. Any Welsh teams, whether it's Cardiff, Swansea, Wrexham, Newport, any of the Welsh, we always try and be the top odds. So at, at the moment, we're two to one Swansea, um, which I think again is probably a fair bet. A bit of momentum behind them with the manager. That's generous, know. that I think. Mean. Yeah? yeah, I'll take that. You happy with that one? Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. Uh, Wrexham. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 Cuthy's bit tonight. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's oh making God, notes. I'm going to Cardiff double. <laughs> do Cardiff, Cardiff well, actually, double. We, yeah. Talking about the doubles, we always do that. So we do a boost. We do all the Welsh teams to win. So the four Welsh teams or the three. So we got, um, I think for the four Welsh teams to win, um, which is obviously Cardiff, Newport, Rich. Swansea, Wrexham and um, Cardiff, Newport, Swansea, Wrexham is 94 to 1 on the weekend. So that's a bit of value. Oh, is it? Uh, well, so a thinking of, well, do you know what? Wrexham Couldn't are playing play? AFC Wimbledon. So they're going, they're trying to get back in the playoffs. Okay. And Wrexham obviously got incentive for game in hand. They could be top on the spin of two games. So Wrexham definitely favourites there to win that one. And then Doncaster, Newport. This is this is the hard one on that, I think, as well. So no, hard to call. To one. Cardiff for the outsiders, the, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah they're they're only 2 to 1. So if you want to just do Swansea, Cardiff and Wrexham, that's yeah. 30. If you want to drop out Drop out Newport. Yeah, okay. We, so, had, we had a lifeline the other week. Sutton scored against the was it the ninetieth minute against Newport? Yeah, they did. Yeah, so, yeah. All the other three teams won. Uh, we were, we we had a painful week. When was it? About a month ago, when the four teams won. That we boosted out to eighty to one, and everyone seemed to jump on it. So that was a terrible. The kids didn't have Christmas presents like they normally do. <laughs> uh, and Sutton United saved us from another near death the other day. They scored in the nineties against Newport when we were, I think, we were fifty-five to one the, the four teams to win. You were the only guy in Wales walking around saying you loved Sutton United that weekend. <laughs> uh, I've got Sutton United scarf on. New it's tattoo. mad. It's mad this weekend though, because Doncaster twenty-eight points, Newport thirty-one, eighteenth and nineteenth against each other. So it's, it's a big game for them. But therefore, you know, Newport as an away team really could win that game. So those are interesting odds. A lot for me to ponder. My wife is going to hate my relationship with you, James, over the next year. She's going to be like, what's all these bets going in? Are they account? I have to set a separate account, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Spend the money well in Gran Canaria is fine. <laughs> uh, good, good. Quickly on the Masters, because Mark Williams is in action tonight um, against Ali Carter. What have you got for Mark to kind of succeed there? Yeah, again, another kind of... Trying to, trying to boost all the Welsh players and the Welsh team. So we've gone 20-1, to 1, uh, Mark Williams, to win the, the whole tournament, the Masters. Um, 
he's he's a great st- he's a great character, isn't he, Mark? He's he has a bet with us at the races. He always tries to steal over the odds. If we got evens on the board, he asks for like ten to one. He's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, very hard man to beat, and he's hard man to beat on the super table as well. Obviously, so twenty to one, probably not a bad bet again. That's a good one, twenty to one for Mark Williams. You know, tried and tested, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? Okay, well, we'll see how he goes against Ellie Carter, and then that because that bet could be dead straight away, or it could be kind of really game on. Um, James, it's been amazing having you on. Um, thank you so much for your support. You'll be back next week. Will you still be in Gran Canaria next week? No, unfortunately not. Got to get back to work at some point. We Got may have to come to a podcast out on their balcony. <laughs> What's that, uh, Gap? So we might have to come do a podcast out on their balcony. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Monday. You're welcome. You've got to start. You've only lost a five with me, Gareth. You lost a five with me at Chepstow once. It wasn't enough. I need you to start having I'll more. Try and get a bag soon. Too tight, man. That's <laughs> but you know the funniest thing about that was that? probably Cathy's tip that made me bid it too. <laughs> but James remembers it. It's a five, but he still yeah, remembers. Yeah. He's got a lot of gain. Yeah, it's only a five. <laughs> James, top man. Uh, we'll speak to you next week. Enjoy the sun while you've got it, mate. And remember uh, to do all your Welsh betting with Dragon Bet, the only place to do your Welsh betting when it comes to sport but of course please gamble uh, responsibly okay let's move on to our next guest uh, on the pod this week and this man i would say is possibly the busiest man i've heard about ever and um, we're delighted to welcome uh, mark vaughan to the podcast uh, welcome mark how are you doing you okay very well thank you very much selves yeah we're all good here um i've looked at your kind of life schedule you've you've got a normal job you've got four kids you're running the welsh surfing federation and you're still competing yourself um yeah. when do you sleep mark i don't <laughs> never no <laughs> what do you want like Very six rarely. eight hours max uh four hours most nights i've got one of those fitbits so i've uh, my missus bought me one for my birthday and um uh, yeah it works out about four and a half hours i think on average my amount of sleep so um wow. yeah Lord. i don't have much time for a running business as well so, uh, yeah, not a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, fair play to you. And you're also kind of harbouring an injury at the moment. Tell us about your injury. Yeah, well, uh, awfully treacherous roads in Planet Major, deceptively flat in places. And I, I tripped over getting out the uh, car, just slipped. It was nice leather shoes with no grip. Feet went from underneath me, two foot up in the air, dislocated elbow, fractured arm, probably three, four months out of the water. So, uh, yeah, absolutely delighted with that little accident. Do you know what? For, for a surfer, because um, obviously we're on a podcast here and people can't see your arm, but you're kind of in a big mm-hmm. cast thing. Um, for a surfer, that's quite embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing, no matter what, especially the old deer that came to my rescue. Um, <laughs> oh, <fair> <laughs> I was very concerned <laughs> and felt that she could, should call for an ambulance. But luckily I woke my brother and, uh, and he lives down the road, so he... Whipped me down to Bridge End, and they, I got to say, they were excellent down there. Got me sorted pretty quickly. Good, good. Um, let, let's talk about surfing then and the Welsh kind of surfing at the moment within the UK and kind of Europe and beyond, if we can. Um, what's yep. on the calendar for 2024? Well, in terms of the Welsh Surf Federation, you know, it, it's for us, there's all sorts going on in terms of European events for, for the junior, senior teams. We, I mean, more recently we had uh, Llewellyn Williams on the Parasite uh, win a gold medal back end of uh, of November December. That uh, he'll be a big name going into this year. It, it's just an endless list of things to do. The Welsh National Championships will help decide the the teams for these events, and we've got multiple disciplines and multiple events that go throughout the year. So uh, we've also got our training now. Surfing's an Olympic sport. We've got paid coaches in place who are working on the elite end to try and push those athletes to get to the final places in the Olympics, which are in Tahiti this year. Uh, even though the Olympics are in Paris, the surfing event uh, is in Tahiti, which is quite a nice venue to go to if you can qualify. So um, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. We've all learned something there today straight away. Yeah. Um, any any Welsh names in the mix to be kind of in Tahiti competing? Yeah, well, it, it's there's only one or two spaces left. The way the qualification uh, works, we haven't got enough time for on this podcast. It'll take about an hour to explain. <laughs> uh, Patrick Dark from Swansea uh, and Alice Barton are, the, are, are very outside chances of making that qualification. But those... Uh, th- those two surfers and others, Logan Nickel, Eli Perrins Davis, they'll be looking at uh, uh, 2028 Olympics in terms of possible qualification. It's a long, long road and multiple avenues to do so, but uh, we wish them every success. And part of the Welsh Surfing Federation's job is to try and push those guys and give them as much training um, and coaching. 
and putting them in the right places in the right parts of the world to try and develop the skill sets. Yeah, talk about pathways then for us quickly. What you know, what, where are you pushing kids? How are you getting kids involved in surfing? Um, I do like to escape kind of west, kind of Mumbles and Gower a lot, and I'll see them doing the lifeguard training a lot, but not necessarily yeah. surfing. So how, how do you kind of bridge them that gap of people who are on the beach a lot to get them to give it a go? Yeah, well, it's it's a difficult one because surfing is quite, you know, it's not like a football that you can just kick around or even a rugby ball you throw around with a few mates. Uh, obviously, there's a whole load of safety measures to that. And we encourage anyone who's, who's starting surfing or enjoying it to join their local surf club. And through that, then that then links into the grassroots and participate in, uh, in the competition side uh, so through the WSF. But as I say, that anyone can pick up a surfboard and go traipsing into the sea. We would advise that you go through your local surf school to ensure you get the right training to then uh, learn your, uh, the very basics to then before, you know, and stand to compete. And uh, equipment-wise, equipment though, do you provide that or do they have to go and buy everything beforehand? Yeah, the Welsh, surf, as Welsh Surf Federation Surf School, that's Langenneth, has been operating the longest surf uh, school, uh, I believe, in the country, beyond Wales and in, in the UK. Um, so yeah, get down to, uh, see James Jones down at the surf shop there, PJ surf shop and, uh, in Llangeneth and, uh, he'll direct you to the Welsh Surf Federation Surf School. But there are others, uh, of our approved surf schools throughout, throughout the, uh, the Welsh coastline. And that would certainly be the most sensible way to start your route into surfing. And yourself, you're in your 33rd year of competing, uh, maybe not mm. for the first part of this year because of your arm situation, but, um, um, talk us through, have you got a career highlight that you kind of, kind of always fond of after a few beers to tell everyone about? Yeah, I, I think um, as the fellas that just been on, I'll we'll, we'll tell you, you, you have your sort of competitive um, highlights as a, maybe as a team. Surfing is an individual event, so there, there's things where you would achieve something like, you know, um, for me, it's a, probably a European silver medal. That's about as, as high as it's come and, uh, you know, national titles. But for me, being on tour with the lads um, in the Mentawi Islands and off the Sumatran coastline in Indonesia um, was, you know, for 10 days on a chartered boat, drinking beer, surfing the grass, best ways on the planet. Yeah, that, that's a pretty good way to enjoy your sport. And no phone signal, hopefully, as well. Absolutely zero <laughs> signal. Zero signal, zero people, just ways, boats, beers. Yeah, good times. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, the wrong sport. <laughs> yeah, you, I was going to say you picked the wrong sport. Um, Gat, in New Zealand, though, is surfing a, a thing that a lot of people do? Yeah, massive. Uh, yeah, clearly, you know, New Zealand's surrounded by water. Um, but yeah, it's massive right across the country. Um, you got to be pretty careful with whereabouts in New Zealand you go in terms of, you know, you get some fairly big rips in New Zealand. The water is, is fairly dangerous in parts, but... Um, yeah, look, along, along, you know, anywhere from the North Island, you know, the North Island's very busy. Towards the South Island, not so much, but still gets a lot of good waves. Uh, it's just a little bit colder. So, yeah, look, New Zealand, summertime right now. Um, I've got a few mates back home from school that big surfers and, and go up for, you know, two weeks at a time. Nice. Down to the coastline and, yep, it's, it's massive in New are Zealand. You, are you decent on a surfboard? No, I, I was always um, more of a bodyboard okay. sort of man. I, <laughs> look, I'd give surfing a go, but didn't really spend enough time. I like the um, the SUPs as well, you know, the yeah. stand-up paddleboards. Yeah. really enjoy doing that as well. We've had a good few times on tour, jumping on those with the boys and, and um, tackling each other off during the waves and stuff. So, uh, no, I really enjoy getting in the water. Alex, what about yourself? Can you surf? Uh, I have surfed once and, yeah, it didn't go too well. I was in Australia in Bondi Beach and got carried away about five miles down somewhere. It was quite scary. And was that with, with well, rugby was, or what? Yeah, it was with, we were with, um, in Lion, on the Lions tour in Australia and uh, the guy's like, yeah, this gave us like a literally 20 minute sort of session. We were, we were like, yeah, we'll be fine, you know, straight out with these boards that were like, they were, wait, they were, they were too big, I think, whatever. and it was real windy. Went out there and we just, see ya. All the excuses. All the excuses there, Mark. It was scary, right? <laughs> Do you know what? I think I might recall seeing in the press. <laughs> so, uh, next uh, Lions trip oh, to Australia. What we need to sort out for Mark, next Lions trip to Australia, he gets to go for that fun day and coach the Lions <laughs> to do the surfing for the I'm day. I'm sure the boys would be keen. I'd be, uh, I'd be up for that. <laughs> Good Put name in, yeah. Mark, listen, thank you for popping on today. No All worries. the best with everything you're doing with uh, Welsh surfing. Good luck with the injury and hopefully um, we'll get some much. of them stars to the Olympics that you mentioned earlier on. I really hope so. And uh, nice to meet you, fellas. And uh, Gareth, I think we last met at the box in uh, the McClay's yep. box in the stadium. That's right. Uh, just back end of the autumn. So yeah, uh, good to see you again. Glad to see your performance in uh, the Rugby World Cup as well. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Other fellas, legends. Cheers, Mark. Cheers, Mark. Cheers for time, mate. Good man. Cheers, guys.
There you go. Hey, a little compliment to finish the pot day for you, Kat. <laughs> Guys, thank you for so much today. Um, Alex, all the best with kind of the Ospreys over the next few weeks and we'll hopefully see you back on the pitch soon. And, and Gareth, thanks for sharing so much uh, earlier on in the pod. Um, we are going to record some additional content, right? Um, we're not going to do it right now, but after this pod, you finish listening to this, if you do go on, there's going to be a five-minute quiz where Gareth and Alex go head to head. They haven't heard about this till right now. How are you feeling about potentially going against each other in a sports quiz, Alex? I'm easily going to win. Yeah? Yeah, he doesn't have a clue about anything. Guy, you look a bit nervous. Depends what it is. I think more general, he'll be better. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll let you know more about the categories in the additional content. We'll see you over there for that ASAP, yeah. hopefully. Uh, thanks for listening today. Thanks to our sponsor, Dragon Bear, as well. Um, so make sure you remember about us next Monday. We'll be back at uh, same time for the Sport in Wales podcast. Also, follow us on Instagram, Sport in Wales. Pick up the magazine also at your local leisure centre, David Lloyd, coffee shops, hotel, lobbies, barbers, salons, etc. We are there. Or subscribe at sportin.wales to have it in your inbox. Um, tell your friends about us and share the love and we'll catch you next week, wherever you go, wherever you are enjoy your sport in wales week sport in wales podcast supported by dragon bet your go-to for welsh sports news and views